All right. We're totally synchronized now. It's like we hit our, the buttons on our watch at the same time. Yeah. I never understood that when I was a kid. They'd be like, let's synchronize watches. And it was like, I guess that's this cool thing you do. But I didn't really get it. <laughs> you, re- you ready to start? We have already started. All this is going in. We've started recording. Nobody wants to hear this. Everyone wants to hear this. This is so cool. I mean, like we just synchronize watches, right? That's the cool thing that <laughs> cool people do. <laughs> like an 80s action movie. Yeah, totally. So no downsides, as far as I can tell. Today, I believe you're going to complain about Tesla the company for two and a half hours, right? Is that right? <laughs> I believe this is uh, week two of the podcast, and we've decided to call it Fungineering. And so I'm Craig Mitchell again. I work for a company. And who are you? I'm Blake Householder, and I work for a company. Great. So we're both engineers, and we decided to do this podcast because we like talking to each other about interesting engineering stuff, and we thought other people might enjoy it. We're still a little skeptical on that part. Blake and I were emailing each other a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned that I had bought a bunch of put options against Tesla stock, betting that they'll go bankrupt. And Blake thought that was interesting and asked me why I think they're going bankrupt. And I just kind of typed one or two sentences. And then I said, yeah, I think I could talk for like two hours on all the reasons I think Tesla is going bankrupt. And Blake said, why don't we do a podcast? And so it was kind of the topic that um, precipitated this whole thing. I I guess, Blake, jump in if you have any questions. I'm going to I'm going to. I'm just going to run with this, okay? Okay, I'm just going to jump right in. Great. Yeah, so you say that it's interesting that you bought these put options, but I think it's a bad idea. Oh, that's (laughs) cool. So, yeah, super cool. Okay. So I'm really interested to hear about the, I guess, spreadsheet that you have that says, yes, definitely do this, Craig, because Tesla, I definitely, I see the struggles that I think that you see, but they just don't seem as bad as I think that you seem, as you think they are. Okay. So I guess I'll, I'll explain what put options are just in a real simple way. It's basically a bet you can make in the stock market. And you say that, um, I'm going to pay some amount of money in order to establish this bet. And then up to a certain point in time in the future, I can force somebody to buy Tesla stock from me at a pre-agreed price. And so the particular options I've bought, the uh, expiration date is January of 2019, and that price is $50. So obviously, I would like for Tesla stock to be worth pennies, so I can essentially buy it 2,000 shares for pennies, and then exercise that option and force somebody to buy all 2,000 shares from me for $50 each. So I paid about $2,200 to buy these options. And if they go bankrupt and their stock goes down to pennies, then I'll be able to sell all of it for uh, $100,000. So basically it's a $2,200 bet with a potential payout of $100,000. So Um, I think a lot of people like to argue about Tesla and stuff on the internet, you know, but very few people put money behind it. And so I think, I think that says something. And I think I have a good analysis here and a lot of reasons for thinking Tesla will go bankrupt. But, um, one thing I don't want to talk about really is Elon Musk because people get like super emotional about him and either most people are either like, oh, he's a swindler and, you know, he'd be nowhere if it weren't for screwing the government, you know. And then other people <laughs> are like, oh, he's he's Thomas Edison crossed with Henry Ford and he's humanity's only chance for getting off this rock, you know. And and people, he's very polarizing. So, and, and I don't really think it's effective. I mean, I don't I don't make stock moves based on, like, the personality of someone at the company. I mean... I don't think that's a good idea. So I don't really care to talk about him. And and like I, I said at the, the close of last week's podcast, um, I'm pretty neutral about Elon Musk. I, he's never harmed me, so I don't really have any strong feelings on him, I guess. Um, I don't feel like that's necessarily the greatest litmus test. That, that he's harmed me? <laughs> never harmed me applies to 
almost all of the bad people in the world. <laughs> right. Well, I also don't see many potential options where he could harm me. I mean, there's not really, like, unless he starts constructing a death laser or something, you know. I see a way. What if he causes strong AI to become regulated? That's, ugh, that's, so we're going to talk about that later. I have a lot to say about the issue of AI safety, but, <laughs> okay. but maybe not in this one. But everything he's ever said about it indicates to me that he's read a couple of books and he's thought about it a little bit and then he opens his mouth and uh <laughs> i wish he wouldn't okay but anyways so on top of that i obviously don't own a tesla um i've never ridden in one i've never driven one there are a couple in the parking lot where i work oh uh, you've got to ride in one they are pretty cool yeah i've seen videos of it on youtube especially videos where guys go out to like eighth of a mile tracks and street race and just hustle everybody and kill them with their their p100d or whatever the the top end model is of the s yeah that's the one with ludicrous speed they even smoke like gtrs on an eighth of a mile track so it's pretty ridiculous it it feels like you're in an amusement park ride <laughs> like it feels like you're on a roller coaster that has a, a launcher instead of a a drop i know the the interesting thing i'll say is actually this last week one day i was walking out to my car in the parking lot at work and one of them drove up behind me and it was a weird sensation because you don't really hear it until it's like six feet behind you and then by the time you realize something is right over your shoulder, it's already pulled up even with you and it's in your peripheral vision. And so it really surprises you. So yeah, I don't really want to get into like the car itself because I don't know much about the car. You know, I'm more interested in the health of the company that makes the car. Um, and like I said, I don't really want to get into Elon and probably not the other companies that are involved. I, I don't think they're that important to the story of Tesla. Okay, I'd like to hear more about that. I'm also interested to know why you don't think the car is important. Because surely you had the chance to research it, and you decided not to. Why do you not think that matters? I, I will actually claim that you think it's more important than it is. Yes, I definitely do, because I'm asking the question. Okay, so I think the reason for that is that you live in California. Specifically, you live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, mm-hmm. More Teslas are sold in California than in the other 49 states in the U.S. combined. And so your experience is you drive around and you probably see a lot of Teslas. And you're like, oh, man, there's another one. They must be like a really powerful car company selling tons of cars. And it's really great. And they'll be, you know, very healthy. And where I live, like I said, there are three that I recognized in my parking lot over time at work. And we probably have like 2,000 cars in our parking lot. We don't really see them often, right? I live in the DFW area in Texas. Um, it's still kind of a pain in the butt to buy a Tesla in Texas. You, you go to a showroom and you arrange everything. And then basically like you really purchase it in Arkansas and then you drive it over the border and you register it. And it's still a pain in the butt. Yeah, I would say that where I So I live very close to a dealership and... In particular, the loop, I, so I've test driven them t three times, and the loop that they encourage you to drive on is my commute. So I actually see all the Teslas in the Bay Area because almost all of them are making this commute and all of the rest of them are in the dealership. They have like 30 and they drive them in this continuous loop. So when I drive to work, I see maybe 30 past me on the highway going the other direction. Then when I get to work, because of where I work, nice tech company, uh, the parking lot looks like a Tesla dealership. Again, I would say we probably have about 20 in the parking lot out of maybe a few hundred cars. And so I see tons of them. Yeah, and, and that's why I believe that you're overstating the importance of the car itself. Because your, your perception is, they're everywhere. And like I said, over half of the Teslas sold in the US are sold in California. Okay, but I think you're thinking I'm making this mistake of making a quantitative argument here, but it's really more of a qualitative argument. When I use the first iPhone, for example, which I think is it's a reasonable comparison to make, I uh, pinched to Zoom on it one time, and then I immediately went and got my roommate and said, look at this, pinch it, just try it, and he did. And he was like, wow, that's it's really different. It's different than anything I'd ever seen before. The real difference was the latency. 
but just that they had produced a 1.0 device and focused so much on the quality of user experience for this particular thing, it was really notable. And uh, I was like, this is, I, I already bought it because it was the internet in your pocket, but the fact that it delivered was really impressive. And I feel like the Tesla, or not the Tesla, Tesla with the Model S in particular is selling this image of it's a different car than the other cars that are out there. And I feel like if you ride in one, or in particular drive one, you'll you'll say, this is a different car than all the other cars that are out there. It's not like the luxury version of something else. It's this different type of car that hasn't come before. And so that's something that makes me wonder about you not researching it, because it seems different in a, in a way that might matter for the future of the company. Okay. I believe it won't matter. I still think the company's going bankrupt. All right. Okay. And um, like I said, I've never ridden in one, and so I really can't speak to that. So um, I want to try to present a case in an entertaining way that even people who own a Tesla will say, I'm at least entertained if I disagree, or maybe they'll say, (laughs) "Um, oh, that's really interesting. I guess Tesla is going bankrupt. I think think they'll be scared if, if they think that you're right, because part of Tesla ownership depends on these lifetime warranties and lifetime maintenance and the continued output of replacement parts and things like that. So it's a little, it makes your car seem like less of an investment if uh, Tesla goes bankrupt. I I think if Tesla went bankrupt, the Model S owners would be okay. I think there are enough Model S's in the fleet that um, somebody would step in and buy the rights to produce replacement parts. The uh, Model X owners, I don't so much have as I don't have as much faith that they'd be okay for replacement parts just because there are mm-hmm. fewer Model X's out there and mm-hmm. there may not be anyone who said who thinks that they can buy those rights and produce parts and sell them and ever make a profit. So I actually had mm-hmm. a friend at work ask me that question last week. I was talking to him about this. So if you own a Model S, I, I really wouldn't worry about that. But um, I suspect most people who own Teslas are pretty confident the company's not going bankrupt. So I doubt they're really <laughs> worrying about that. They're probably like chuckling right now. They're like, this guy's never driven a Tesla and he thinks they're going bankrupt. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's exactly the noise they're making. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, I wanted to go through real quick and just talk about the different cars that Tesla has built and that they want to build, that they've talked about building, that they're getting ready to build. They began with the Roadster, which was this little two-seater. Basically, most of the car was produced by Lotus, and Tesla provided the drivetrain and mated them together. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they had this whole idea where we'll make these super expensive cars first that have high margin on them because, you know, expensive luxury cars have higher margins than consumer cars. And so with those profits, then we'll develop the next lower tier of car, And down and down and down until we have enough money that we and enough of the um, infrastructure set up, the factories and all the support and everything and experience that we can build mass market cars. So Mm -hmm. they started with the Roadster and then they went to the Model S, which is a, a luxury sedan. And then after a few years, they released the Model X. It's a crossover SUV. It was actually, I think, more expensive than the S for the the biggest most optioned one but you know they were still focusing on like the high-end luxury market where you know you could you could option the cars out to like a hundred and forty thousand dollars and i think the base models cost about eighty thousand or so you know yeah it did feel like they're going in the wrong price direction with that one (laughs) you mean doing the x after the s yeah and the x was i think it's strictly more expensive i think there were only two drivetrain options for the x Mm. and then okay so the next one is the model 3 which is supposed to be this mid-size luxury sedan basically they're they they say they're in production now what they're doing um as of now july of 2017 is building 30 hand-built models that's the beginning of the production and at the end of this month july they'll have this um delivery event they're going to deliver the first 30 models to the first 30 owners then they plan to scale yeah. up the production to eventually hit uh, 5,000 models per week by the end of 2017 is the plan to build that many. That is a big jump. Yeah. And I'll get into why that's not realistic. 
<laughs> so um, last year, I believe in April or May, they had this big unveiling of the Model 3. And, you know, they made this big media spectacle about it. And they opened it up for reservations. So for $1,000, you could go online and you could get basically get in line to eventually order a Model 3. And so your $1,000 is just to hold your spot in line to eventually order a car. Right after that happened, Tesla said, hey, we got 373,000 reservations at $1,000 each, you know, of, of uh, to hold the place. And, you know, look at all this interest we have in this Model 3. But the reservations are completely refundable when it comes time, you know, when Tesla sends you an email and says, hey, it's your opportunity to, you know, order a Model 3, you could go on their configurator website and decide not to order one and you'll just get your $1,000 back. Or at any time between now and then, you can just call Tesla and be like, hey, I want my $1,000 back. I'm not interested anymore. And you can have it back. Yeah, but also asking people to put up $1,000 for something that's completely refundable is still something where for most offers you could potentially make, no one will give you a thousand dollars. Yeah, and so getting it from a lot of people is still a signal. Yeah, I think so. Um, and they got three hundred and seventy-three thousand of those initially. Now mm -hmm. they haven't updated the number at all, so it's been fourteen <laughs> or fifteen months now, and oh. they've been asked directly, and they've refused to update that number, which is suspicious. So. You would think if they were up to 500 or 700,000 or a million, that they would beat that drum and say, hey, look at all these reservations we have. It's going to be even bigger than we thought. But they've refused on several occasions to update that number. What if it's just 390,000 now, which is not, it's not worth it. You wouldn't want the press to talk about that. Yeah, I think, I think 390 would be a bad number for that to be at right now, to have only picked up 20,000 in the last 14 months. Hmm, okay. So that's a little bit on the Model 3. Um, the, mm -hmm. They have on the plan, the next vehicle they want to produce is called the Model Y. So it's going to also be a crossover style vehicle like the X is, but it'll be smaller and cheaper. It will not be built on the same chassis as the 3, though. So one of the things they did to make production more efficient is the Model S and the Model X are both built on the same chassis. And with the same drivetrain. And so that simplifies the production. They can run on the same production line. But the 3 is different, and the Y will be different again. After that, they want to build an, a battery-powered semi-truck, which is of questionable utility, because to go long distances, you would need a lot of batteries. it take a long time to recharge. Um, and semi-trucks have come a long way in the last 10 years in terms of fuel efficiency, pollution, and noise levels. So it's unclear if this if there's really any market for a electric semi truck. And after well, that, one of the things you could do with a semi truck is use battery replacement instead of charging. Yeah. So battery replacement is an interesting idea. Uh, Tesla early on talked about providing that as a service, where you could drive. They do your provide it. Excuse me. They do provide it, or at least they did. No, they never provided it. So what they did... I thought they did. They, they did a, a media event where they mm -hmm. uh, talked about battery swap on a Model S. And mm -hmm. so the idea was you would go into a, um, a recharge center and there would be a couple mechanics there and they would swap the battery on your Model S and it would only take like five minutes or something. And they demonstrated it on a stage one time. And they... That was automated. Um, the demonstration wasn't. I don't know if the final plan was to be automated or not. The demonstration appeared to be automated. Okay. I thought that was what they were selling. No, I don't think so. Hmm, okay. okay. I thought it was, the batteries are replaceable with a set of lug nuts, and so the idea was, you'll never do this. But should you choose to, the lug nuts are in a certain position, and they can be handled with automated tools, and everything can be gotten to through the bottom of the car. And so they were sort of like, if this ever becomes a thing it can become a thing. It's not like you have to pull out one of the motors to replace the batteries. And then what I, my impression was that they offered these stations. There were four or six or something, but they saw very little use. Because I think there's this sort of fear of, well, what, 
what battery do I have now? <laughs> Which is, it's a little weird. It's like someone replaces the engine and gas tank in your car every time you stop at the gas station, and you're like, well, what are, what's going on now? Yeah, so they, they had a, a theoretical payment structure for this where you would be somehow compensated for like the difference in life of the battery for the one you were getting mm-hmm. and the one you were, you were uh, giving up. And then the idea was most of the time you would come back through the same station on your return trip. So you would use this on longer trips. They set this up, they demonstrated it on stage once, and they never implemented it. And then they got a credit from the state of California for it. So event, essentially something like a, a zero emissions vehicle credit like they get from the, the federal government. But mm-hmm. they got it for basically saying they were going to do it and that they were implementing it, and then they never did it. And so all mention of the battery swap has disappeared from their SEC filings. So it's no longer a thing they plan to ever do. Mm. Okay. So with the semi-truck, you could do it, and it could be useful there. But it's really, there, there's, there are a lot of good articles out there um, debating whether or not a battery-powered semi-truck has a purpose. <laughs> I, I, I guess for, for some very specific jobs, it may be really useful. But the idea that it's going to replace the semi-fleet in the U.S., I don't think is is correct so way out past the semi truck they want to develop a pickup truck and they haven't really talked much beyond that because they're still working on getting the model 3 released um and then they basically have three other vehicles on their plate after that and they have a lot of work to do if they want to ever get there but they have a couple of other products that they offer they bought solar city last year so they offer solar panels. Interestingly enough, uh, the Solar City deal is its own disaster for Tesla shareholders. <laughs> Basically, Solar City was a failed. It wasn't just a failing company; it was a failed company. It was on the verge of bankruptcy, and Tesla surprised everyone in the world by suddenly saying, "We're going to buy Solar City," and everyone kind of scratched their head and said, "Well, why? You're a car company." And so they came up with this elaborate explanation that like, you'll buy a Tesla and then you'll buy solar panels for your house and you'll buy these power wall battery packs and the solar panels will charge the battery packs and then the battery packs will charge your Tesla. And it'll be this whole like Tesla ecosystem that you buy for your home and it'll involve your car and all this stuff. And it, again, there, there aren't any real good legitimate synergies between a solar panel installation company and an electric car company yeah that's true and the other thing is there are a lot of better solar panel installation companies out there if if they let's say there really was a good business case for buying one there would have been better ones to have purchased than one that was essentially bankrupt because it owed so much money so it, it was a bad choice a, sy- a synergy I could think of would be we're going to remove the financial risk from this for you. So we will pay you to install solar panels on your house, and then we will sell you the power over a long period of time. And so then people would say, oh, well, I can make a few thousand dollars now, and then I'll get my power for cheap for a long time. And eventually the total cost of ownership will be higher, but whatever. Like I might not even be in this house then. And so they could do that kind of long-term thing for you, except buying a bankrupt company is probably not a good way to say, hey, we're willing to take on like long-term financial stuff for our customers and make it work eventually. Like It immediately puts you in the hole some amount of money. But in their defense, I could see that strategy being a strategy. One reason I would give for why they bought SolarCity is that uh, Elon Musk was on the board of SolarCity. And his cousins, uh, Peter and Lyndon Reeve, were one of them was the CEO of Solar City, and the other one was also on the board. So there is very strong family tie there. You think that might have had something to do with it? It could have. Again, I don't want this to, to devolve into like name calling against Musk and his cousins and stuff. You know, I, I, it doesn't have to be name calling if you say these people knew each other. Yeah. Okay. And and yeah. Additionally, Elon Musk held and the reeve brothers too all three of them held a lot of what were called solar bonds 
and these were basically uh, non-recourse bonds that Solar City. What's that mean? It it means that there's no uh, collateral backing them up, and there's no there's no guaranteed discharge in bankruptcy. Not discharge, repayment in bankruptcy. So if Solar mm. City goes bankrupt. All the people holding these solar bonds are just out of luck. So mm. Elon Musk and the Reef brothers both held hundreds of millions of dollars of these bonds that they had bought from Solar City, and they were getting paid. I don't even remember the interest rate, but Solar City was essentially bankrupt and was not going to ever be able to repay these bonds. And then out of the blue, Tesla says, "Hey, let's buy Solar City," and they do. And then. Interestingly, Tesla decides to send money to Solar City because they didn't merge the companies. It's just that Tesla owns Solar City, but they're not one company. Tesla decides to send money to pay off those bonds, returning the capital to Elon Musk and his cousins, Lyndon and Peter Reef, in the form of several hundred million dollars. So um, additionally, all the existing t- Solar City stock turned into Tesla stock at some ratio. Stock held by Elon and Lyndon and Peter that was going to be worthless was then really valuable Tesla stock. You know, draw your own conclusions, but those three guys made a lot of money by the fact that Tesla bought Solar City. Okay. So, um, in addition, so going back to, you know, solar panels, um, Tesla has this power wall thing where it's basically a large battery pack that you put in a building. They kind of try to market it as you can buy this and again, your solar panels will charge it during the day and then at night it'll discharge into your Tesla. It's debatable, uh, um, you know, these kind of products already exist. There are a bunch of bunch of companies that make stationary battery storage. It's a very commoditized product. Tesla does not produce the battery cells themselves. Panasonic produces them and sells them to Tesla. So Tesla isn't even the first supplier. They're not the producer. So there's a there's another markup in between there. So it's debatable that Tesla could ever sell these at a price where they could beat the competition. Although isn't their argument there that they're going to build their Gigafactory and then they'll make the batteries? I will go into a long discussion of the Gigafactory, but essentially <laughs> Panasonic produces those cells in the Gigafactory. <laughs> Tesla has Tesla has okay. no intention of producing their own battery cells in the Gigafactory. Okay. And even today, every battery cell that is produced in the Gigafactory is produced by Panasonic on equipment owned by Panasonic. Does that matter? It does because Panasonic has to make a profit. Why does that matter? Well, because if another company producing power walls or an equivalent stationary battery storage product builds their own cells, then they are making the product themselves. They're not selling them to another company that then also needs to make a profit by selling and installing these. Hmm. Ultimately, Tesla has shareholders and they need to make a profit. They can't just be a charity. I never got the impression that being a charity was one of their goals. There's an interesting quote out there. I wish I had gone and and found the exact words, but it was something that, that Elon said just kind of off the cuff one time. And it was like, I'll be happy if Tesla accomplishes nothing else but advancing electric car technology and, you know, market penetration. And, and, it, and you know, you hear that and it's like, well, I wonder what your shareholders think about that idea. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't seem like one of his true goals, though. I think that's just something he would say. Yeah, um, that's debatable. But again, we don't want to talk about that. Sure. Okay, so then there's these this uh, solar roof product that Tesla um, came out with last August. They introduced it. It was supposed to go into production and have its first installation in June of this year, and that didn't happen. They currently don't have a factory to produce these in. Um, they made some weird statement that they were sold out through 2018, which I guess if you have no production, it's really easy to be sold out. <laughs> But the solar we sold out of all zero. So the the solar roof idea is is you'll make solar panels, and instead of these you know big ugly black solar panels that go on your roof on top of your asphalt shingles, you'll instead have these like nice looking tiles that from the ground just look like normal roof tiles, but from above you can see that they're actually solar panels. 
again, there's a lot of problem with this product. Uh, a lot of companies have tried this before and all of them have either abandoned it because it's a bad idea and it doesn't work, there's no money to be made, or they've gone bankrupt trying to do it. People will say, well, Tesla's different, they'll, they'll succeed. I think I can convince you otherwise once we start talking about the numbers and money. Okay. Basically, it's an old idea that's been tried a lot and no one's really interested. It, it doesn't work out. Uh, one of the problems is you have to put a colored film over it so that it looks correct from the ground and that immediately reduces the efficiency of the solar panel again because you're blocking some of the light that comes in it's it it's kind of a, a joke sham product i don't think it'll ever come to market because like i said right now they have no production capability for it they're apparently not installing it anywhere so i i think it was just kind of hey look at this tesla's doing something else you know and I think they do that a lot. They try to distract from when bad numbers are coming out, when their delivery numbers are down again, or their inventory build is up again, or their cash burn is at a record high again. They'll make tweets about, oh, look, new solar tiles, new power wall, new, you know, all these things to kind of distract people from these other problems that they're having as a business. Hmm. So they have some other kind of products, right? So they have dealerships, they have a a direct to customer model where they don't have a independent dealership network like traditional car companies do. So when you see a Tesla dealership in your city, Tesla owns that. It's not owned by someone else just selling, you know, Fords or or GMs or Toyotas or something else. So Tesla pays all the cost, but they also sell directly to the customer. So the idea is they pay that upfront cost, but they also have a higher margin because they're selling, they're performing the retail sell themselves, not just the wholesale sell. Yeah. So they've also got service centers. Again, they run all their own service centers for now. It'll probably stay that way, even if they avoid bankruptcy. It's likely that for quite a while, they'll still operate all their own service centers. There won't be competition. And then they have their superchargers where you can go and recharge your car for free as long as you purchased it before January of this year, I believe was the cutoff date. The network is expanding. It's never expanded as fast as Tesla has guided for at their their quarterly conference calls. So they'll talk about, you know, they want to build this many more dealerships, this many more service centers, this many more superchargers by, you know, some point in time. They've always fallen short of those numbers. It's a little worrisome to some people that they want to sell 200,000 Model 3s in 2018 and not increase the supercharger network very much. In some parts of the country, some superchargers, there are long waits during peak times. So your car may take, you know, 30 minutes or so to, to charge up, but you may have an hour wait to get onto the supercharger. So some places that's mm. a problem. Although... I guess I could see them saying, well, we're going to provide some superchargers, and then we want people to start being the equivalent of gas stations and selling this product. Yeah. And if they're a, a monopoly on providing power, and they provide it for free, there will never be any real market competition. For the most part, you're correct. The competition will come from superchargers, and I'll just call them that, even though that's Tesla's words for it, but, you know, charging stations for electric cars. It'll come from competition from ones that provide charging for different types of cars with different plugs and charging at different rates. So there's this uh, agreement between, I want to say it's Toyota and VW and GM or maybe some of the other big manufacturers, and they've agreed on a standard for like plug type, charge rate, things like that. And they're building a network of them already. And they have plans for, you know, some giant network by some date. But they broke ground like a year ago, beginning to build that network across the U.S. So there is a competing network coming in already. Oh, are those not compatible with Tesla's? I forget exactly. I want to say that um, Tesla has, you know, the patent on their type of charger. And then they kind of told everybody, hey, you guys can use that so that we all kind of keep these things compatible because it would kind of suck if you had to go to a different gas station, right, for, for yeah. your Honda. 
You have the VHS gas station and the Betamax gas station. Yeah. I can definitely say at work, there only appears to be one type of charger. And I see Nissan Leafs and Model S's and uh, Chevy Volts all charging at at it. So I wonder if that's just a 110 volt charger, though, because I'm pretty sure they'll all take that. My impression was that the 110 volt ones took like 40 hours to charge your car or something. And so they're barely worth it. But I know that the Tesla owners at work have talked about being able to get home or not if they charge their car. And so it charges, it sounds like it charges a significant amount per hour. Also, they've sent out little passive aggressive emails where they're like, the charging parking spots aren't just for parking your car all day. They're for charging your car. And then when it's charged, you need to move it. (laughs) And it's like, maybe you shouldn't conflate parking spots and charging also. (laughs) Also, they're right at the front of the parking garage so they're the good spots so everyone wants to use them yeah so um sales of tesla cars have plateaued so for a long time tesla has said oh well we're we're supply constrained right production constrained so we're building cars as fast as we can and they're all sold when they come off the assembly line and for a couple years that was true that stopped in the last four or five quarters um, the mm. Model S sales peaked in the fourth quarter of 2015 at 17,000 sold. And in the first quarter of 2017, so five quarters later, they were 13,000 sold. It's peaked and kind of bounced around a little bit. So they're no longer experiencing huge growth in sales. Total deliveries of cars have been flat for four quarters. You know, the the narrative that they're supply constrained and that they're they're growing by this great amount is no longer true for Tesla. They've, to some extent, saturated the the early part of the market for the S and the X that would that would consume them. Some people like to say, well, sales were up fifty three percent year over year. You know, when the second quarter twenty seventeen numbers came out recently, the delivery numbers they were up fifty three percent from the previous year's second quarter, but not really. The third quarter of last year was the first quarter that they had full-scale Model X production. So second quarter last year was still only partial production, a little less than half run rate of the Model X. So they hadn't really completely introduced the car yet. So they've basically had a second car in addition to their first come onto the delivery numbers in that time. So it's not completely honest to say that delivery sales were up 53 percent i mean they doubled the number of products they were offering yeah okay there there's another problem that's that's kind of come to light in the last several quarters it's huge inventory build for tesla what's inventory build when you look at the numbers that they release they'll tell you like the number produced the number delivered the number in transit and you can look at those and you can figure out well how many are how many were built minus how many were delivered, minus how many were in transit. And if you run those numbers quarter to quarter for a while, you can see that their inventory is building up. And so what Tesla has said is that um, we need these cars as service loaners, you know, for people getting their cars worked on, and we need them as test drive vehicles. And so Mm -hmm. the, the internal fleet of Teslas owned by the company used for this stuff has grown to over 14,000 vehicles. I can definitely confirm that the dealership near where I live has something like 30 cars on its lot. Yeah. But they also have, they have them out being test driven during the day. And as far as I can tell, sometimes all at the same time. Yeah. So this, there are a couple problems here for Tesla. One is these are like fully optioned models. These are like P100Ds, right? So these are Mm -hmm. $140,000 cars. Because Elon has said recently that when you take your Tesla in for service, he wants you to get a top-of-the-line car as a replacement to pay you back for your inconvenience of having to bring your Tesla in. So these are very expensive cars. So the secret is you should never get the best model because then he can't apologize to you. So, so... (laughs) (laughs) They've, they've built this huge inventory up over the last several quarters. But if you've got 14,000 cars and they're $140,000 each, that's a huge amount of, of 
capital expenditure that you've put in those cars. I'll get to it in a bit, but Tesla's hemorrhaging money already and really having trouble. So it's weird that at this time, they're building all these cars and they're not selling them. And it's hard to say whether they're all legitimately test drive cars because they have been building inventory on lots for a while now since they're no longer supply constrained. They're basically waiting for orders to come in for cars they've already built. Okay, so let's say we're in one of two scenarios and go through each. So one is Tesla recognizes that they're failing. What would be the reason to build out this fleet? One idea I had is that when the the federal uh, zero emission vehicle credits expire, they expire in such a way that it would benefit Tesla to have a huge fleet of cars ready to sell. And I'll get into that in a bit. Okay. And then say they're sort of willfully ignoring that they're failing. Why would they do this? Because they don't want to show numbers to the to their shareholders that say, hey, we reduced production because there's just no demand for our vehicles. Okay. 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 So I wanted to talk about the Gigafactory a little bit. Um, the Gigafactory is this huge factory in Nevada that Tesla has built. At various times, they've said it's there to uh, produce battery packs, battery cells, drivetrains, maybe another car. Maybe they'll use it as, an, as a vehicle assembly plant. So the, the one plan that has remained consistent is they'll use it for battery packs. And this was sold to the state of Nevada as, look, we're going to bring in all these sub-suppliers. We're going to have basically dumping raw lithium in one end of the building and getting finished battery packs out the other end that will go to the Tesla factory in California to be installed in cars. In total, Tesla got from the state of Nevada about $1.3 billion in handouts in order to do this. That's a lot of dollars. It's, it's a bunch. We'll get into even bigger numbers later, though. It's going to be great. <laughs> so first, they got the land for free. So what happened is the state of Nevada went out and bought the land from a real estate developer who owned it. I believe they paid $43 million for the land and gave it to Tesla just for free with no strings attached and no way to take it back. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah, it's really nice of them. <laughs> <laughs> then the state of Nevada gave Tesla a bunch of sales tax abatements, a bunch of property tax abatements, a lot of transferable income tax credits. So, right, they, instead of paying income tax, they have this credit and they're transferable. So even if they never do, in, even if they never make any income in Nevada, which they haven't, they would be able to sell these credits to other companies, you know, for a little less than a hundred cents on the dollar. And those companies would then be able to apply those credits to their income taxes for the state. So that's essentially just free money. Yeah, it's just free money. Um, yeah. Tesla, interestingly enough, all of their like concept art of the Gigafactory shows the roof covered in solar panels. To this day, there's still not a single solar panel on the roof. And it shows in the <laughs> background this wind farm. Why wouldn't you just have a, another set of solar panels in the background? Uh, because you need to greenwash the whole thing. Okay. Despite this, the state of Nevada also gave them reduced electricity rates. And they made up for that by raising the electricity rates for residents of Nevada. So if you're listening to this and you live in Nevada, you're paying a higher electricity rate at your house today because Tesla is getting a reduced rate at the Gigafactory. And they still don't have a single <laughs> solar panel on the roof. <laughs> The last thing that the state of Nevada gave was they constructed an extension to, of, to a highway to lead to the factory. So there was no highway access. So they were like, hey, we'll just go out there and we'll extend this highway for you. Well, if you're going to do the rest of those things, that doesn't seem too unreasonable. In for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> so um, I would also, I would throw in free signs if I was Nevada. <laughs> so all of this came... Um, in exchange for Tesla supposedly creating all of these really high-tech jobs at the Gigafactory, right? So they would mm -hmm. build this factory and there would be a bunch of transient construction jobs. And then long-term, there would be a whole bunch of manufacturing jobs turning raw lithium into eventually completed power uh, 
units for the cars. Now, we get some insight into these numbers a bit after the end of each year, because they're only published by the state of Nevada once a year. So we still don't have the final 2016 numbers. We have the final 2015 numbers. They were expected at the end of 2015 to have 700 full-time employees working at the factory. They only had Mm -hmm. 272. Mm -hmm. And at the end of 2016, they were supposed to have 1,700, so an additional 1,000. So we don't know how many they actually had. We suspect it's not really that much better, and it's certainly not going to be 1,700. They're way behind schedule on construction of the factory, as in they've completed, I think, two of the five phases, and at this point, they're supposed to have been working on the final phase. So they really haven't spent the money in it that they told Nevada they were going to spend in order to get all these concessions, but Nevada really doesn't have any way to claw any of this back, so it's okay. The money's gone from Nevada's point of view. Well, if I'm a a Nevada politician, I probably don't care so much because the big win for me would have been the ceremony at the beginning where I look like I'm caring about green stuff and then nobody is going to really keep track of how the project does later. Yeah, no one's going to much keep track. And even if they do, they're not going to hold you accountable. So yeah, if you're a taxpayer in Nevada, you got host though. (laughs) <laughs> it's all right because there's some people driving model s's so yeah hopefully you drive a model s i don't know i don't know maybe you should still feel hosed if you drive a model s and you're a nevada taxpayer i'm not sure maybe we can get some feedback <laughs> maybe inside the gigafactory though they produce these power packs these uh battery cells and then they put them together you know they produce the power wall and they produce the the battery packs for the cars So their main partner in the Gigafactory is Panasonic. So part of the agreement that Tesla has with Panasonic is Panasonic is guaranteed a certain profit. Panasonic will build a certain number of cells with a certain lead time from Tesla telling them how many cells they want. And then Tesla has to buy all those cells. Right, and they're guaranteed a profit. So if Tesla miss forecasts, they'll end up with a whole bunch of cells that they have no use for, but they must purchase them, and Panasonic is guaranteed to make a profit. So it's a pretty bad deal for Tesla. Also, Panasonic is uh, in there with their rent-free. There were supposed to be a whole bunch of other companies. When this agreement was signed, Tesla said you know they would have like a dozen partners in the factory, Right now, it's just Tesla, Panasonic, and an unnamed German company that does stampings of battery housings. So you put, you know, all these cells together into this huge housing. This German company has some machines in there to stamp them. So Panasonic is producing all the cells for Tesla in the factory. Now, Tesla has another factory, a third one, in addition to their Fremont vehicle plant, and the Gigafactory in Nevada, this is the Riverbend factory in New York State. It's near Buffalo. The Riverbend facility is its own kind of mess for New York, the same way Nov- the Gigafactory is for Nevada. Basically, New York gave a whole bunch of concessions to Tesla. Nothing ever happened at the factory. It's still empty, apparently. The terms of the agreement have been changed several times in order to become more lenient for Tesla and to allow them to never be held accountable. So the terms themselves basically, um, oh, what's the term? There's a term in contracting, uh, force majeure, something like that, where it's like if there's an unforeseen event, then you get out of jail free and no one can enforce the contract. And so they expanded the language of how that's defined for that contract to be so broad that New York has virtually no recourse left. And Hmm. there's much speculation for why would New York agree to that? And it probably comes back to what you said, which is Governor Cuomo got to stand up and have a really awesome press conference and say, we're going to manufacture like the highest tech solar panels here at Riverbend. And it's great for the U.S. and all this stuff. But New York's gotten hosed on that deal. And it's unclear that Tesla will ever make much of anything in that factory they are on paper partners with Panasonic in it also, but... Probably if they don't go bankrupt, they'll eventually use it. Uh, yeah, I would guess. I mean, they're getting paid to do nothing right now. I don't know. 
But their main factory, though, is the Fremont Car Factory, which is also a very interesting place. So the Fremont Car Factory started life as the NUMI factory, the New United Motor Manufacturing. And what that was was a joint venture between Toyota and General Motors from 1984 to 2010. So Toyota and GM produced cars together at that factory. Um, Basically, GM wanted to learn about lean manufacturing from the Japanese, and the Japanese wanted to learn about making cars in America and suppliers. Is that where... What? Is that where the GM1 car came from? No, no. Or was it EV1? I can't... No, that didn't come from there. Oh, okay. I saw the model of car they produced together there. It was sold under the GM badge, but I forgot because it was some boring car, you know, some, like, small, cheap car. I I forget exactly what they produced there. Okay. But they operated this together for, like, 26 years, and, you know learning things and eventually uh, you know 2010 comes around the whole automotive industry is in decay gm's gone bankrupt and been bailed out and all this stuff and gm's like we're just not going to do this anymore and toyota wasn't interested in going on either and so they shut it down and it sat empty for several months and it was just fortuitous timing because at that point tesla needed a factory a proper factory to move into and so tesla bought it for something like 25 million dollars or so and set up their manufacturing in it. At the peak, under NUMI, the factory produced 430,000 cars in one year. That was their best year ever. And on average, they produced 312,000 a year. So far, Tesla has produced at most 94,000 in a year, and on average, 72,000. So Tesla is running at about one quarter of the production capacity that GM and Toyota ran that factory at, which... You know, the the sales have plateaued, so there's just no demand, so there's not really a point of running the factory four times as fast. It's very questionable whether Tesla could. But it doesn't sound too important that they do. I, As I'll explain later, it's critical that they don't, because as they produce more <laughs> cars, they lose more money per car. So oh. uh, it it's critical that they don't run the factory faster. They should slow it down to zero. Okay. Employment-wise, Tesla has 6,000 employees working at the factory currently. At the peak, NUMI, run by GM and Toyota, had 4,700 employees. So Tesla has about 25% more employees. These are just the manufacturing employees, right? So they're running 25% more employees to produce one quarter as many cars. So, you know, their their cars produced per employee is about 12.1 for Tesla, and it was over 66 for GM and Toyota. That's a pretty stark difference. Yeah. So Tesla's producing one-sixth as many cars per employee at the factory. Apparently, their production methods are still very hands-on. So one of the problems Tesla has is the paint shop. So they've guided that they want to build... Originally, they said they wanted to build 100,000 Model 3s this year and 200,000 next year and... Now they've kind of toned that back a little bit. You know, they've, they've, the guidance has gone down and down and down over time, but they have a problem with the paint shop, which is it's in California. So they need all these permits from the local government in order to release the volatile gases from painting the panels of the cars. And so it's a very well known problem. There are a lot of people around who worked at NUMI under GM and Toyota who have talked about this, who say, You can only paint panels for this many cars based on the permits that Tesla has been granted. So if Tesla wanted to increase production up to the numbers they've guided, they would need different permits. And they haven't started the process. So that permitting process is public, and they haven't begun it. So they literally can't produce as many cars as they've said they want to next year from the factory because they can't paint them. Hmm. Yeah. And they they have some other problems. Uh, they're kind of running out of space. The plant will probably hold the Model S and Model X like it does now, the production for those two. And on a separate assembly line within the same plant, they're producing the Model 3. Now, remember, the Model Y does not have the same chassis. So they're not going to produce it there. Okay. So they'll probably get the Model 3 there. 
But again, it's debatable if they can produce 200,000 Model 3s a year at that plant, given the way they run it. So the land on three sides of the plant is owned by other people and in various stages of development. So they can't just expand it. Also, they're having a lot of complaints recently that the parking lots are full because they have so many employees there. The parking situation is getting tough, so they can't just like demolish a bunch of parking spaces. I think ultimately their plan was, well, robots will produce the whole car and we won't have anyone working here, but um, probably <laughs> we'll see if that actually happens. Hmm. Maybe the biggest problem the company has is money. Obviously, if you're going to go bankrupt, you do it because you're out of money, right? That is what bankruptcy is. a good did. reason. So yeah. um, the problem for Tesla is that it has never made a penny of profit on a single thing it's ever sold. And people talk about this and, and proponents of Tesla get kind of caught up on which profit line on the income statement is important. Okay. So when mm -hmm. Tesla builds a car... They buy parts from suppliers and they buy raw materials and turn some of those into parts. So they take these parts and they take some labor and they put those together and a car comes out. And so then they sell this car for a certain amount of money to a customer. Mm -hmm. And they make a profit there. Now that's a gross profit, right? Mm -hmm. So on the income statement, they have a gross profit because they sold the car for more than the cost of the input materials and labor. But then you have a cost called SGNA, which is uh, selling general and administrative. And what this is, is costs related to selling that car that are not captured in the raw materials and the labor to produce the car. So it's things like transporting the car to the owner, things like running the dealership, paying the salesman, things like that. So Tesla's SG&A costs are over twice the industry standard in terms of percentage of the, the car's cost to sell to the customer. Okay. In the first quarter of 2017, their SG&A costs were 29% of the sales cost. So they sell a car, but nearly 30% of the sales price of the car goes to paying for SG&A. So... Their gross margin on the car, remember the difference between their raw materials and labor to what they sold the car for, the, mar the gross margin on the car, that gross profit, didn't even cover their SG&A expenses to pay the salesman, to pay for the uh, sales center, to pay for transporting the car. Okay? Okay. That means that once you've paid all the marginal costs of producing that car... Tesla is in the red, okay? They end up with an operating loss, which means they've never made a penny selling a single car. Okay, well, so maybe they lose a little money on each car, but can they make it up in volume? No, and this problem only gets worse at scale. <laughs> this, this is a joke. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. I know, a very famous one, <laughs> but not all of our listeners may know that joke, right? It was an insurance industry joke, wasn't it? I don't know. Someone in insurance. Okay, so no, they can't make it up at scale, and it gets worse at scale. So the reason it gets worse is that a lot of those SG&A costs don't go down. Like, you still have to pay a salesman to talk to a customer. You still have to transport a 4,500-pound car to a customer. You still have to operate sales centers, and you probably need more sales centers, a proportionally larger number of sales centers to sell more cars. And it gets even worse because when you introduce the Model 3 and it's a mass market consumer car, it will have a lower gross margin to start with. It's the nature of selling mass market cars. So yeah. you have a lower gross margin and your SG&A costs either stay the same or increase. So now your losses become even more negative, your operating losses. So... This is a problem that's going to get worse with the Model 3. Elon Musk himself has said that margins on the Model 3 initially, even the gross margins, will be, and I quote, horribly negative. That at first, the Model 3 will cost much more to produce in labor and parts than they can sell it for. Does this mean that being an early adopter of a Model 3 is profitable for the consumer? 
well, there's still money out of your pocket and each consumer has to make their own value judgment. That's true, but does it mean you're getting an underpriced car? Yeah, you're getting an exceptional value, but you're not making a profit. So you heard it here. Craig's telling everyone to go out and buy a Model 3 the second it becomes available. Don't worry about what happens later. (laughs) Question mark, question mark, step four, profit. (laughs) So the thing to take away from this is Tesla has never made a single penny of operating profit, okay? People like to make comparisons between Tesla and Amazon and say, oh, well, Amazon didn't have any profits for like 14 years now, you know? I was going to make that comparison. That's great. It's wrong. Okay. (laughs) Amazon had operating profits. So after paying the cost for, you know, the thing you bought from Amazon, after paying for the shipping... After paying for the sales costs, which I guess is like website related fees and development and things like that, the marginal costs to sell that one widget to you, they still had profit. Mm -hmm. And that's what they plowed back into the business to grow the business. Mm -hmm. So they had no net profit at the bottom of the income statement because they were plowing that back into R&D and CapEx, Mm -hmm. right? So capital expenditures like more Amazon fulfillment centers Mm -hmm. and you know, leases on 747s so they can fly their own packages around and things like that. Yeah. Amazon was and is always focused on free cash flow. Yes. And they they really care about how much money they have available to redirect into other business ventures because they spend all of what they make. Yes. And now Tesla has never had operating profit. Okay. So there is no money to plow back into the business to grow. All the money for R&D and CapEx to essentially grow the business, right? So R&D is let's design a new car and CapEx is let's build a new car factory, as an example. Mm -hmm. All of that money comes from cash burn fueled by debt. So it's all from issuing new stock, issuing bonds, using revolving credit lines, things like that. Mm. So Tesla is not... Tesla is not showing no profit because they plow it back into the business. There's just simply no profit. They lose money on every car they sell. And like I said, the SG&A situation gets worse at scale. And Tesla's own performance has been that they show larger and larger operating losses per car as they sell more cars. Okay. So the the whole situation gets worse and worse as they've gotten bigger. And that's why when I talk to people about this, I say, well, the optimal thing for Tesla to do is to immediately turn off the assembly line. Because if you're losing money on every car and you're losing money every time you start producing cars faster, you lose more money, then stop producing cars because you're just losing money. You're bleeding money everywhere. Okay. Okay. So um, I went and looked up for actual cash burn numbers. This is the money that they lose on every car they sell plus the money they spend on R&D plus the money they spend on CapEx, you know, expanding their factories and building service centers and superchargers and all the rest, right? Mm -hmm. So in 2012, they lost $500 million. In 2013, they only lost $6 million in total. In 2014, they lost over a billion. 2015 was $2.1 billion and 2016 was 1.4 billion. So this is money that is replaced by uh, issuing more stock, issuing bonds, uh, uh, leveraging assets they hold in exchange for revolving credit lines, things like that. Okay. So huge amounts of money that Tesla is losing because they have never made a profit on any car they've ever sold. They have always lost money. Okay. Okay. So say you're a a C-level executive at uh, Tesla, like you're the CFO or whoever, presumably some amount of your compensation is in the form of Tesla stock. So why don't you just, why don't you leave the company? An interesting point on that is those kind of actions, like when an executive sells stock at a company, they have to report that to the SEC. Mm -hmm. And Lyndon Reeve, Elon's cousin, while he was still at Tesla, every month when his stock would vest, he would sell it immediately. Mm. He would unload it the day it vested. 
So okay, he apparently because typically a, a C level exec is better informed than you. Yes, and you're betting against them, and they're sort of betting for Tesla by keeping all of the stock. Um, I have a list further down of all the executives who have left the company in the last two years. Oh, okay. Yeah. And once they leave the company, they no longer have to report that to the SEC. So probably they all sell it that day. Um, I, I will not speculate on that. <laughs> I think it would be irresponsible to speculate on that. Okay. You can draw your own conclusions. We can see if there's an uptick in volume of trading after they leave. Except that probably that would be investors also, not just them. It, that would be an interesting analysis. I would like to see that. Somebody to go through and look at like every executive leaving and then see if there's some standard period afterwards where there's an unexplainable uptick in volume. It might get lost. Yeah, there's so much noise in that. And there's so many mm -hmm. other things that will affect the volume that I don't know if you yeah. could ever tease that number out. Yeah. Okay. So... That's the, the cash burn situation. And, and you know, uh, Tesla only has so much money in its pocket, right? It's hard to say exactly how much they have because you only get these numbers updated about every quarter. And Tesla is very opaque in their uh, SEC statements, much more opaque than normal companies. And so even people who are professionals at dissecting this, which, which is where I get most of this information, even those people can't really completely understand the, the financial situation there. Because there are a lot of standard things that companies report that Tesla doesn't, or they mix them in with other numbers to obfuscate them. It becomes difficult. They probably have somewhere between about two and four billion dollars on hand. And like I said, last year they burned $1.4 billion. They did a capital raise earlier this year by selling new stock, diluting the existing shares. They may or may not do that again. I'll get to that. There's reasons for that. I want to turn to a concept in the auto industry called car turns. This is the idea of how many times per year does all the... Do all the parts in your supply chain turnover, right? Okay. So, yeah. so you know, you, as a car company, you have hundreds of suppliers supplying you with parts, and they get into your logistic chain at some point, and then at some point, they combine into a car, and it goes to a customer, and it's out of your logistics chain. And so the question is, how often can you turn that over? And obviously, the more often you can turn it over, the better right? Because you're not carrying mm -hmm. that cost. Or if you carry the cost, you can turn it into a profit more times during the year, right? Yeah, the dream would be that you're running a, a magical machine where you throw raw materials from the earth into it and cars pop out and you sell millions of cars this way. And so you turn it over millions of times in a year. Yes. So Toyota is the industry leader. Toyota turns cars 33 times a year. Okay. Would you like to guess? I guess that's good. Would you like to guess how many times Tesla turns in a year? Four. Three. <laughs> Close. So, so what does that mean, right? So it means that at any given moment, Tesla has all the materials in its supply chain for one third of a year of production, which means mm -hmm. all the capital cost of all those goods are sitting in the supply chain and not making money, right? What you would like is for only the capital cost of one thirty-third of the cars that you're going to sell this year to be in your supply chain so you don't have so much capital tied up at any time, right? You're turning it over faster. Yeah, it means they're sitting on four months of value before they're able to realize it. Right. Okay, so let's say that they're going to sell 200,000 Model 3s per year, okay? And one third of those will be in their logistics system at any given time, right? And mm -hmm. we'll be really generous and we'll say it only costs Tesla $30,000 to build a Model 3, which eh, maybe I could believe that number. But if you do the math on that, 200,000 cars, three turns a year, so you divide by three, and then you multiply it by a $30,000 cost on each one, that's a billion dollars of capital just for the parts to get the M3 to that production level. 
So they need a billion dollars in cash just to put that many parts in the supply chain so that they can turn it only three times a year and produce 200,000 cars a year. Do you think they could have any kind of plan that improves that velocity? They haven't to this point. It will require them to manufacture faster. It will require them to actually have demand for that many Model 3s. There's a lot of debate about that, and I didn't want to get into that issue because, again, it's highly speculative. Okay. You know, what will the Model 3 cost? What will the demand be? And it typically devolves into arguments of, oh, it's a beautiful car, I'd buy one, or, oh, it's ugly and I'd never buy one, you know? (laughs) And it just gets into kind of stupid arguments, and I don't know. Supposedly, the starting price of the Model 3 is $35,000. A lot of people don't think that anyone will ever be able to buy a Model 3 for $35,000. Tesla has said that they are only providing two options initially to the initial buyers. If you are on the reservation list and it comes up and they send you an email and you go into the configurator, initially the only options you'll be able to choose from are the color of the car and the wheels. Huh. And so they're not op- they're not offering the uh, glass roof initially, which was a big selling thing they, they talked about for a long time, you know, this glass roof over the top. They're not offering any other options. Those are your only two options initially because they're, they're trying to keep the price of the car high. They're probably only going to sell highly optioned vehicles. They're going to say you have to pay for autopilot. You have to pay for, you know, whatever luxury upgrade. You have to pay for the bigger battery. And we're only offering that car initially so they can offer high margin cars to start with. Okay. They're, they they underperform the industry terribly on car turns per year. And it just means they have tons of money, tons of capital tied up that's not producing as efficiently as it should be producing. It's very bad. The company is also, in in addition to just burning money like a giant bonfire, (laughs) they have an insane amount of debt, okay? So... Wait, would would burning the money as a bonfire maybe be more efficient? (laughs) You wouldn't get nice cars, though. But it sounds like they should produce zero cars. I think maybe they, they should switch to your bonfire strategy. I think that they should neither produce cars nor burn the money as a bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just wishful thinking. <laughs> so Tesla has about eighteen or sorry, sixteen billion dollars of unsecured debt, right? So these are parts vendors. These are Model Three deposits, which are fully refundable. These are other types of unsecured debt and contractual commitments. So all of those, as of December 31st of 2016, totaled $16 billion. Their secured lenders, they owe $600 million to as of that date. This is for their direct leasing, where they use car titles as collateral. So they owe $600 million for that. And then they have a revolving credit line called the ABL Agreement which as of that date was uh, $970 million outstanding. Its upper limit Mm. is $1.25 billion. Essentially, it acts like a credit card. You know, you have a credit card and it says, hey, you can spend up to $20,000. And at any time, you maybe you spend $1,000 and you pay it off at the end of the month, you know. So it's Mm -hmm. just a revolving credit line with uh, predetermined conditions, right? Okay. So... These are all recourse debts. So people can come after them in bankruptcy and and try to get paid for them, right? And this debt totals $18 billion, okay? And like I said, they they probably have somewhere around 2 to $4 billion of cash on hand right now. They have $18 billion of debt. I don't know what their assets are valued at, but they have huge amounts of debt. As far as any lifeline of another company coming in and saying, oh, well, we'll buy Tesla, you know, well, Mm -hmm. that debt comes along with it. Maybe you could buy their intellectual property, but if you do that, then the Tesla stock goes to zero because it no longer represents a company that owns the intellectual property, and then my puts pay off and I win. So, you know, that's fine with me, but it, (laughs) it doesn't help you if you're a Tesla shareholder. Yeah. They have... $658 $658 million of solar city debt that is coming due in 2017 at various times. 
at a time when they have probably somewhere between two and four billion on hand, they have 660 million in Solar City debt coming due. Next year in 2018, there's another $330 million of Solar City debt coming due. You know, they don't make a penny of profit on any car they ever sell. So paying off that debt comes from other debt from issuing bonds and issuing new stock. So essentially, it's like juggling credit cards when you're heavily in debt. They've, they've got one credit card coming due in the form of Solar City debt, and they're going to pay it off by either issuing new Tesla bonds or using money from issuing the last set or issuing dilutive stock. So they're just juggling money from, from one place to another. Because again, they have no profits. Hmm. All of that is complicated by tightening credit market. So when they issued bonds in early 2017, the overall rate for the bonds was about 6.1% interest, which is firmly in junk bond territory. So the bond market treats their bonds as junk. Um, the restrictions on their revolving credit line, the ABL agreement, have gotten more and more strict over the years as the company has gone further and further in debt and their ability to ever repay becomes more questionable. Mm -hmm. So those restrictions talk about um, they have to have a certain amount of uh, cash relative to total debt, and there, there's all these uh, tests they have to meet. And from interpreting those it appears that they can only issue about another $150 million in bonds. Really not a lot of headroom left to issue bonds. Uh, the stock market will probably accept a lot more dilutive share issues. And there's good reasons for that. There are a lot of banks that basically write glowing projections for what Tesla will turn into. And then they collect huge fees when Tesla issues more dilutive shares. Mm. And in general, interest rates are on the rise. So... You know, all this debt, eventually it refinances, bonds refinance, um, the ABL agreement comes up for renegotiation at very various points, and the interest rates will go up on that. So just the general interest rate environment is not kind to Tesla right now. And remember, this is interest on $18 billion of debt when they have zero profits. Yeah. So a problem coming over the horizon for them is the expiration of the federal uh, zero emission vehicle credits in the U.S., so these ZEV credits. So what this is, is the federal government will give someone a tax credit if they buy a zero emission vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. And so the credit is $7,500, and this goes to the purchaser, for the first 200,000 cars made by any given manufacturer. Right. Mm -hmm. So your customers, your, your first 200,000 customers that you sell to get this benefit. And arguably it makes buying your car a lot more appealing because I can get a $7,500 tax credit from the federal government for it. It phases out after you've sold 200,000 cars. And the way it phases out is that in some quarter you hit 200,000 of sales. And for the rest of that quarter, all your customers still get to claim the $7,500 credit. For the next two quarters, they still get the $7,500 credit. Then the two quarters after that, the credit's cut in half to $3,750. The two quarters of after that, it's cut in half again to $1,875. And then it goes away. Okay. And so okay. this is a, a very predictable decline of this credit, right? Yeah. So Tesla has sold about 170,000 cars to date. Now, some of those are foreign sales, and it's, it's a little hard to pick apart those numbers. They'll probably reach their 200,000th U.S. sale in the fourth quarter of 2017. So that credit will phase out through 2018 and be gone at the end of the second quarter of 2019, though it'll be getting smaller up to that point. Something interesting has happened for Tesla in other places where there have been government subsidies for their cars that have expired, which potentially show problems ahead with the ZEV credit expiring in the U.S. So in Denmark, the government stopped waiving an import tax for Tesla. So for a long time, they waived it for Tesla specifically because they were electric cars and, you know, they're all into that. So then they stopped waiving <laughs> it. Um, in 2015, Tesla sold 
2,400 cars in Denmark. And then the import tax came back at the beginning of 2016. In all of 2016, Tesla sold 176 cars in Denmark. That's a bit of a decrease. Yeah, so their their sales went down to, what's that, like one thirteenth of what they had been. Something similar happened in Hong Kong. Uh, they had a subsidy for the Teslas that expired at the end of March of 2017. In March, Tesla sold 2,939 cars in Hong Kong. And in April, they sold zero. <laughs> and in the state of Georgia in the USA, um, there was a state subsidy for electric vehicles. And when that went away, uh, electric vehicle sales cratered in the state. I couldn't find specific Tesla only numbers for that. I could only find overall EV numbers. But the total sales cratered after those subsidies went away. The, the experience so far has been that when those go away, Tesla loses sales badly. And they're going away on a known schedule in the U.S. And they're phasing out as they go away, too. So you should expect that the sales will decrease along that phase out. Hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't look good. I wanted to get into um, executive turnover at Tesla. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to read through the list of all the executives who have left in 2016 and so far in 2017 this was actually pretty hard to compile because every time i'd go to google and i type in something like executive leaves tesla i would be bombarded with articles with all these different dates on them like all these news articles from different points in time of executives leaving tesla i do want to say one that was in 2015 their their chief financial officer left the company. And this one's interesting. I'll come back to him specifically. He left near the end of 2015. But in 2016, they lost the VP of Global Communications, the VP of Product Technology, the VP of Finance, the VP of Production at a car company, the Chief Information Officer, the VP of Manufacturing, the VP of Autopilot, the VP of Tesla Energy, and then in March of 2017, they lost the CFO again, the chief financial officer. In April, they lost the chief policy officer. In June, the former head of the former CEO of Solar City left. And in July, just about a week ago, the head of the solar roof product left. A lot of probably pretty bad positions to lose. Things like autopilot and manufacturing and product technology and the chief financial officer twice. And that's really the interesting one because not only did they lose the chief financial officer twice, but when they lost him the second time, the previous guy came back. And so you had a guy in there who was in the job for about 14 months and decided to get out. And, and there's a lot of speculation that, well, he's the chief financial officer. He signs off on the books. He signs off on the SEC submittals. You know, and if things are really looking this bad inside the company, but the message that, that the company gives out is that things are still great, that's maybe not a good thing for your career long term as a CFO to be attached to the downfall of Tesla. Mm -hmm. But maybe, you know, you've listened this far, nearly two hours, and you say, well, gee, something will save Tesla. Right, because maybe you own a Tesla, or maybe you think Elon is our last best hope for humanity, or you know something else. Um, <laughs> and and so you know there are some common arguments that are brought up. They have this great advantage in battery cost. You know, well, uh, the battery cost for the car is about twenty three hundred dollars. So even if they could, that's like raw material cost. So even if they could gain a large advantage in that. It's only a small percentage of the total cost of the car, even if they could come up with some big advantage. Yeah, even if they get it to zero, right. they're still negative on every car, right? Right. They'll, they'll still okay. lose money on every car, even if, they're, even if Santa Claus delivered batteries to the Fremont factory every day. It might happen. Another problem with that argument is the whole battery industry is highly commoditized, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very competitive. There's very low margins. And there's no test, there's no evidence that Tesla holds a real technological advantage, right? So they use these 18650 cells, which is a, a battery type, like if you own like a modern 
very nice flashlight. It probably uses 18650s, which is what is powering Teslas. So they, they don't have some great technological advantage. Again, they don't even produce their own batteries. Panasonic makes them. Sometimes an argument is made that, well, you know, there will be a breakthrough and, and there will be some new battery technology and it'll drive the cost way down and the energy density will increase. And the problem with that is that in Tesla's agreement with Panasonic at the Gigafactory, Tesla has to pay the cost to switch to new manufacturing technology for Panasonic. So even if the technology changes, Tesla is on the hook to pay that cost up front. It wouldn't be Panasonic that would do it out of profits they make from Tesla. So the battery issue won't save them. Okay. Okay. There's another argument that Tesla will be first to the market with full self-driving. That's a really bad argument. Currently, the autopilot system on Tesla is level two autonomy. It's a really good level two autonomy, but... What's level two? It can control steering and acceleration. Okay. So you have, you know, lane assist and cruise control and auto braking. Okay. But I was in Florida about two months ago for work, and I had a Toyota Camry rental car that had level two autonomy. (laughs) You know. Now, when you watch videos of it on YouTube, like, it's more capable like it will change lanes for you which a lot of the other ones won't i think the other ones won't not because they're not capable of doing it but because the company doesn't want to risk it at this point mm. tesla has also been adamant that lidar uh a kind of a form of laser radar is not necessary for full self-driving and tesla is unique among all of the companies working on Autonomous cars, in this opinion, they're the only one who thinks that it can be done without LiDAR. Hmm. I would argue that it can definitely be done without LiDAR. And as an example, I can cite every car that everyone drives all the time because no one has LiDAR installed in themselves. And so a sufficiently advanced computer algorithm driving a car should be able to drive it with basically two cameras. Because that's how people drive it every day. Yeah, with enough processing power and enough technology. However, I would not give up on the advantage of having LiDAR if I can put it in my vehicles. That's stupid to do. So for a while now, Tesla has claimed that all of their cars that they're currently manufacturing come with all the hardware required for full self-driving and that they only need a software update to enable it. But they don't include LiDAR. Also... People have done teardowns of Teslas and looked at the actual processors on board for this. So the processor that they're using on board is less than half as powerful as what NVIDIA and Mobileye think will be needed to achieve level five autonomy. Mm. I'm not convinced by that argument. The, The thing is, I think people significantly underestimate algorithmic improvements. We've seen things like computer chess programs and go programs also go from not being able to beat competent humans to being able to beat anyone in the world with a cell phone and you you could say oh cell phones have gotten very very powerful in terms of their processor and ram and stuff but they haven't really gotten that crazy powerful it's that the algorithms have gotten a huge amount better like the program that's actually playing chess is playing it it's using its resources a lot more effectively to play chess And I think that there's a lot of machine learning advances that are going to come that essentially they'll require a lot of offline processing to create a very compact program that does not need a lot of memory that will be able to drive the car very effectively. So I don't find that to be a very compelling argument. However, I find lots of your other arguments to be compelling. So, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh, this processor is not powerful enough to do it. Like it'll probably be fine at some point in the future. Okay. Well, it, I, I think at the very least, you would have to concede that Tesla is betting that the software upgrades will get them there. Either that or they figure out a workaround, like, we're recalling the Teslas, bring them in, and then they stick a, you know, a five-year or more advanced chip in for very low cost, and they're like, there, now you're more powerful. Right. You can and, do it. Right. They can do that, and their margins go more negative. That's true. Right. So they're, yeah. they're, they're essentially betting that the software will get them there. So they're neglecting the sensors and the processing power. Yeah. 
It, I think it's that's a reasonable gamble to take, though. Okay. Really good hard data on, you know, exactly where different companies are on uh, self-driving tech is hard to come by, right? <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless, yeah, you steal it I, and go to another company. <laughs> I, I saw this really great thing while I was researching this, and it, it was some commentary about that. And the, the author said that um, the world of self-driving cars creates this paradox where you need to simultaneously not tell anyone anything, but bombastically parade around your advances. Mm -hmm. And so there are a few stats available, like California requires companies who are testing within California to tell them how many miles they've driven and how many times the car has disengaged on its own. Basically, how many times has the AI said, well, crap, I don't know what to do, so I'm turning it back over to the driver. Mm -hmm. And in that case, basically, Google beats the crap out of everyone. Based on that data and some other data that's available and various analysis of people who are much better experts in self-driving than I am, it's obvious that at least Google, GM, Toyota, and Nissan are all ahead of Tesla in self-driving tech. Mm. So Tesla doesn't really have any advantage in self-driving. It's not going to save the company. There are various other crazy arguments, like they'll capture, you know, 90% of the world market share of all car sales, all this crazy stuff that doesn't take into account like average age of cars on the road, which even in the US where we're really rich is like 12 years old, something like that. Cars just don't get replaced that often. And in the developing world, they can't, they don't have the energy infrastructure to drive electric cars anyway. So I, I don't think there's anything to save them. I think they're burning cash so fast. They have never made a penny of profit on anything. Um, personally, I'm not convinced that the Model 3 is going to sell that great. I think it's going to be too expensive for what you get. I think it's going to end up costing over $40,000 and much closer to $50,000, in which case it's no longer a mass market car. Yeah. The amount of competition coming to the market is incredible. I mean, there's something like 60 new models of electric and hybrid cars coming to the market in the next three years in the U.S. So Tesla won't enjoy the advantage that it's had in the past where it's the only electric luxury sedan. That time is mm. ending. And, and not only are these coming to market, they're coming to market from manufacturers who are really good at making cars and who are profitable. Okay. So I feel like you've explained pretty well why... You definitely think that nothing is going to save them. So that would have been one of my questions. Is how could you be wrong? So another question I'd have for you is, why you bought your puts for a specific date. Why do you think they'll have failed by then and not later? Those were the longest out ones I could buy. Oh, okay. That's a good reason. I, I believe in January of next year, the puts for two years from then, so the January 2020 puts will be available, and I may buy some more of those then. Okay. Just to hedge my bet against them not going bankrupt by January of 2019, and to give it another year. So you sound pretty certain. Why not invest more into it? Because this is not a type of investing I've ever engaged in before. I'm typically a very boring investor who buys like large blue chip companies that pay really good dividends. And then I just sit on that and collect dividends. So mm. um, the only reason I got into this is because I enjoyed reading articles about Tesla. And then I got more and more addicted to reading articles about them. And I read more and more for like the last two years, I've been reading articles about them, like almost on a daily basis. And over that time, what starts to sink in is that the people who think Tesla is going to become the first trillion dollar company and capture 90% of the market share of worldwide auto sales, they base that on their love for Elon Musk and how cool they think the car is, right? And the people who think Tesla is going bankrupt base it on dissections of the financial statements. Mm. And there, there is not a core of people who examine the finances, examine the numbers, examine the debt, debt load and the cash burn and the margins and say, we think they're going to a trillion dollars. <laughs> Maybe a trillion dollars of debt. <laughs> no, that's not serious. Nobody would ever loan them that much money. 
That's true. What do you think, Blake? Do you think they're going to go bankrupt after this analysis? I feel much more convinced. Are you going to go buy puts? I might partake of the January puts that become available. The 2020? They might not offer... Yeah, they might not offer such a rosy deal then, but maybe so. I... It's the same reason you have. I am a pretty boring investor. Um, actually, I guess I'm a less boring investor than you. I think I'll, I only buy S&P 500 index fund and Amazon. Um, and then my other investment has been Bitcoin, which is, I, on paper, it has paid off very, very well. Very well. But for Bitcoin, it was the same thing that you did. I did an extremely deep analysis of it, and I was convinced that, one, this was a thing the world has never ever seen before, which is not too hard to figure out, and two, in such a way that it will not die, and it will be worth a lot of money in the future. Indefinitely into the future. I don't predict it ever going to zero like some people do. Um, but it's it's very hard. If, you, if you're a, I guess intelligent investor one of the first things that you learn and that you need to learn is how little you know and how much you don't even know that you don't know yeah and once you learn that and you really feel it it almost paralyzes you and so someone can put the best deal in front of you and you can become really convinced and you still think i can be fooled and you just cannot commit enough money to it i guess that's okay it because like you sound pretty convinced this is worth a lot of money. You should probably put like half your net worth in it, right? <laughs> but it's just, you can't do it. You can't cross that mental chasm. Right. So, um, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And that's why I only felt confident doing this after reading so much about them for so long. Yeah. And, and then, you know, when that stuff starts to happen, you start to say, well, does this have predictive power? You know, will will there be ridiculous tweets of nonsense products to hide bad financial numbers? And then you see that there are. And then you see, well, will they not update Model 3 reservations? And they still won't. You know, people ask them directly. And so you become more confident. And even then, it's like, well, I only put $2,200 in this, you know, and yeah, I could probably put 10 times that much tomorrow into it. And I could probably put 100 times that much into it over the course, you know, liquidating other things. And, you know, but it's how confident are you? And if you lose the whole $2,200 and maybe they're a trillion dollar company by January of 2019, then, well, are you okay losing that $2,200? Yeah, 2200 bucks, I'm fine with losing. Maybe not $20,000, so... You know, so I felt confident enough in my knowledge and my analysis to say, yeah, I'll risk $2,200, especially when the payback is $100,000, you know, it's like a 48 to one payback. So when, when, well, I think that's, I think that's nearly irrelevant. Why is that? I think you really want, you want to calculate your EV. Well, if I had to take this risk, but the payback was only two to one, it would make it a lot harder to want to take the risk. Maybe that's irrational. I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, it helped me. Because, like, for example, when you're investing in your blue chip stocks, you're still making a choice. Do I hold this in cash, or do I put it in blue chips? And for both of those, the returns are very unimpressive, no matter what direction. You know, you can think of inflation, or what if the dollar falls? What if the stocks have a bad year or however long you're in them for what if they do well and in all of those it's pretty boring returns but you're still forced to make a call and so then you say oh well okay i i will make a call on this um and that seems normal to you but then if someone's like what if it's 2x what if it's 5x what if it's 10 then you start having these irrational things i feel like really you should just have a spreadsheet where you're saying what's the chance that i'm right what's the chance that i'm wrong and then you multiply that out and then you just look at it mm -hmm. yeah do you have any more questions? Hmm. What about SpaceX? Okay, so SpaceX is really interesting. And if you had talked to me like three years ago, I would have told you the two most important companies of the 21st century would have been Amazon and SpaceX. I no longer believe Amazon is one of those, but I think SpaceX still is. 
Wow, I feel completely the opposite of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Maybe we could have a podcast about that. If SpaceX stopped existing, it just wouldn't matter. Who cares? But Amazon Amazon is gradually replacing business. They're becoming the man that is in the middle of every transaction. And I see them as... We could indeed talk about Amazon for a long time. I see them as this unstoppable force of capitalism and free market trading. I think SpaceX is probably a a well-run company. Okay. So the interesting thing is SpaceX was founded by Elon Musk, and he's the CEO. Um, Tesla was not founded by Musk, but he joined early, like within the first year, and he is the CEO of, of Tesla. So SpaceX is... I don't want to say it's his company because he has a lot of private investors who own parts of the company, right? Some percentages. Some people like to ask me this. So like, you know, when I get into this conversation with folks at work, they'll be like, well, what about SpaceX? And, and there's a difference between SpaceX and Tesla. And the difference is SpaceX is privately funded. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that there are several, you know, billionaires and, They've given a lot of money in exchange for partial ownership of the company, and then SpaceX used that money to start developing rockets, and now SpaceX launches payloads in exchange for money. They maybe make a profit, probably. I would guess they do. But because it's held privately, the people have better power to hold Elon Musk's feet to the fire to not let him get away with the shenanigans that he can get away with at Tesla. So at Tesla, Elon holds something like 10 or 12 or 15% of all the stock in the company. Large investment banks own like 60%. So the total float of stock that's available to regular people to buy is like 30% of the company. And they can never outvote Elon. They can never hold his feet to the fire. And so he can do all of these things like continue to sell cars at a loss and, you know, bail out Solar City so that he and his uh, cousins get paid for their solar bonds and their worthless Solar City stock gets turned into valuable Tesla stock. So there's no one to stop him from doing that at Tesla. At Solar C- at SpaceX, there is. Hmm. That's why I think the companies are run differently. Why do you think SpaceX is one of the most important companies in the 21st century because i think they'll make a lot of money how putting stuff into space i don't think it's that valuable maybe maybe they'll find that legendary cache of pentium processors (laughs) oh yeah so i did a back of the envelope analysis on that it looks like each processor that you brought back from the apollo program would have been it would have cost you about 3.3 million 1970 dollars to get so it's still not so unless Unless you were bringing those processors from the future, (laughs) they probably weren't going to be worth it. But even if you brought them from the future, the whole constellation of technology to use them isn't there. It would have shown up. (laughs) You've watched Terminator 2. That's exactly what Cyberdyne Systems is doing in that movie. (laughs) Nice. Also, I think the processors would have been large. I think an Intel technician from the 70s would have been able to look at the processor and say like yes i see what i see what they're doing here they would have been able to reverse engineer engineer enough of it and at the time those processors would have been what a a billion times faster than the computers that existed well you'd only have to get one of them running right and that's exactly what miles dyson said he said that like we can't make it run but we've learned incredible things from it in terminator yeah so just but i think you'd be able to get it to run you just send it a clock signal that's fast enough and then you'd be able to send it commands and all you'd have to do is figure out a few of them and using it at even a fraction of its capacity it would have become a single test bench running a processor from now in 1970 would have been i think more than the total amount of computing power in the entire world at the time so you would have been like maybe maybe the first one's worth 3.3 million (laughs) the rest of them probably aren't marginal cost or marginal uh utility drops really fast but so why is taking stuff to space so valuable i like i know a really good place to put stuff 
and it's called Earth. <laughs> you just put it on the ground. That's a really valuable spot. I think they have some sort of term for it, like real estate, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And that's worth a lot. So why do you want to put everything in space? There's only a few advantages to being in space. It's really advantageous if you have satellites. You need them in space. Yeah. How many satellites do you need? I don't know. Maybe a lot. Maybe a whole lot. Maybe? I, I feel like there'd have to be something... We'd have to be able to point to something and say, the marginal utility of this type of satellite is almost linear with number of satellites launched. Like, uh, an imaginary receives solar power from the sun, beams it down with microwaves type of satellite that's always present in sci-fi. And so you put one up and you get one unit of power from it. And you put another up and you get two units of power. And, and if the first one was valuable, then the nth one is valuable because you keep beaming down more electricity. But instead, I don't see any satellite that's like that. There's communications, there's spy satellites. There's some potential for manned tourism, but I don't think there's a future where there's billions of people in orbit because it's just not that valuable to be in orbit zero g so you get to float around that's cool but that's it's not i think people would want to visit but they wouldn't want to live there so much and then you can go to other planets but they just sort of de facto have less value than earth you don't think you can potentially create greater value there how would you do it I mean, maybe there's something I'm not thinking of, or maybe there's something that hasn't been discovered. But even even say you go land on Mars, and it turns out that there's just this, like, mountain of all of the periodic table sorted by order of how many protons it has, and you can just <laughs> scoop it up. So, again, it's the Pinium processor analogy, but, but say they're just all there. There's just whatever, like, oh, there's just, you can scoop up rhodium by the handfuls, or iridium, or something like that. It, it's still so far away from Earth, it costs so much to get it back. And then what can you build on, on Mars that's really valuable? Really good telescopes? Really good, I don't know, processors? It, it's just so far away. And the value of it, I think, diminishes to basically zero because it's just so far from Earth. It's just cheaper to spend a lot more money on Earth to get the thing because it's still less money than you'd spend interacting with space. I think if you build the transportation systems and the infrastructure and the autonomous robotic capability to do these things, then the cost goes way down. Yeah, but say the cost goes down a lot. Say it goes down by 100. What are you going to do with it? You bring resources that you can't get as easily here. Are you thinking of asteroid mining? Um, I don't really know much about that. Like, I'm not really sure if that's a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> Something that has always amused me about asteroid mining is that any company which achieves the ability to mine asteroids is also a de facto nuclear power. <laughs> They're a superpower. It's silly. Yes, because they could bombard any nation on Earth with the equivalent of a nuclear weapon, <laughs> and there would be no way to defend against it. 